right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you guys are able to join us this morning as we uh, continue our sermon series going through growing pains and hearing some of the things that Paul has to say to the Corinthian church and uh, some of the ways that they are kind of told that they should be growing and some of the things that they need to start changing about themselves. And at first, we really looked at division present within the church, and we kind of dealt with that, and now we get to deal with some of the stuff today uh, that really starts to kind of step on toes and makes people uncomfortable, and some of these pains that we can probably start to associate with growth. But uh, before I I do that, I wanted to uh, briefly talk a little bit about Thanksgiving. So I hope everybody here had a good Thanksgiving. Is that kind of the, the general consensus? Most of you guys had a good Thanksgiving? I had a good Thanksgiving. I got to spend it with uh, some friends of mine. They, we met in college. They invited me to join them for, and, and their family for Thanksgiving. And so uh, off to Iowa I went. Uh, I know that here we decided to host a, a little Thanksgiving for those who were just looking for a place to go for Thanksgiving. And I thought that was a really good idea. Uh, I heard that the turkey was really good. I heard that the desserts were good. And uh, I know for me, the food that I had was pretty good. And all around, we, we have a lot of good food for the most part on Thanksgiving. Uh, one of the things that I did particularly enjoy was uh, some chili. So I went to stay with my friends, and uh, their mom made some, some chili. And uh, one of the things that they did, which for the most part, if I ever grew up eating chili, I always ate it out of a normal bowl. One of the things that they did is they bought these, like, they brought this bread, and uh, it was like the fresh dough, or I don't know, I wouldn't call it fresh dough, but it was dough. And, uh, you know, they put it into, like, a ball shape and allow it to just grow, and, you know, kind of uh, the yeast starts to expand the the bread, and, you know, they bake it. And they did it into, like, the bread bowls that you would get at, like, a fancy restaurant. You know what I'm saying? Like, have you guys ever had those? I don't know if they're actually fancy, but to me, if I'm eating chili out of a bread bowl, it's fancy. I really like bread, and so I didn't even eat it as a bowl. I just grabbed like the whole thing. It was like this big old roll, really, and I just ate it plain. Uh, but I like bread products, and a while back I, I ended up trying to experiment, and I, I tried to make my own bread. And I, I'm sure maybe some of you remember me like talking about that and how upset I was that I accidentally burnt it because my oven burned too hot. And you know, part of the issue that I had with it is that. It's a long process to make bread. If you've ever tried to just like make bread on your own, you know that it takes a lot of time. It's a very time consuming thing. And the reason for that is that when you're making bread, you put yeast in the bread, right? And the yeast, you have to wait for that to sit in so that the bread starts to expand, right? And so you have to sit there. And if you've ever seen it happen, if you've ever bake your own bread, you know what I'm talking about, where like you start to put all the ingredients together, you put the yeast in, and for the most part, you end up waiting a couple of hours to watch this bread start to rise, or to watch the the dough start to rise, and it goes from this little ball, and if you put it into like a bowl, you start to watch it expand and expand and expand to the point that it gets like nice and fluffy, and then for the most part, sometimes you, you know you end up punching out the bread and you punch out all the air and then you allow it to do that a couple of times, you know, to, to get your bread ready. But the, the truth is, is that as we look at scripture today, we're going to see that Paul compares something to the yeast that gets put in bread. He compares something to bread and how it expands and how it grows. And we're actually going to see how that's not a good thing. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have to look at this through the lens of Paul, right? So Paul, before he becomes this Christian missionary, he starts out as a Pharisee. And so he has to understand the Old Testament law, and he has to know all about that. And one of the ways that the Hebrews were always raised is that they were not supposed to have yeast in their bread. They were supposed to keep that out of their bread, and they ate what they called unleavened bread. And so if you've ever eaten like Middle Eastern food, if you've ever eaten at the Greek restaurant, and you uh, get like a gyro, or you get their little pita chip things, or you know, whatever it is, that is the unleavened bread that they would have been used to, as Paul is writing. And so they were used to not having uh, yeast 
in the bread, and so as a result of not having that present, the bread ends up flat. And it doesn't grow, and it doesn't rise. And if you listen to some people, they'll try to break it down scientifically in the Old Testament as to, you know, why they weren't supposed to have yeast, and some people try to make it a little scientific and explain that there's some kind of, you know, biology reason that they shouldn't be putting it in there. It, it just depends on who you're listening to. Uh, I would argue that the reason that they don't have the, the, the yeast in the bread is symbolic. And if you have heard anything similar to this, you probably know where this is going. The yeast kind of resembles sin. The yeast in bread resembles sin, and how sin, if you allow it to set in, it starts to grow, and it starts to change, and it starts to kind of get out of hand, and the situation becomes bigger than it actually should have been. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the first thing that we see from the chapter is that Paul hears this report. He hears this report about sexual immorality, and he hears this really weird thing of a man who is found that is sleeping with his father's wife, and he has to quickly nip this in the bud because he hears this, and he says, look, even the Gentiles don't do this kind of stuff. Even the people who are of the world are not doing this kind of stuff, and so it should not be present with you. It should not be there. And so he starts talking about church discipline and how we ought to be dealing with this, or more accurately, how the Corinthian church ought to be dealing with this situation of sexual immorality present in their own church. And some of the instruction that he gives is that they ought to kind of remove this person who's doing this from the, the, the congregation, from the fellowship that is present there, in order for them to be corrected. That is the purpose. Is so that what's going on there is not tainting the rest of the church. Because what Paul finds at this church is that as this is going on, he finds these people kind of boasting about this situation. And it's almost as if they're not understanding in reality what the grace of God is all about. And they're just kind of accepting this as if it's okay. Does that sound similar to our church today? Wouldn't you say that that sounds pretty similar about some of the stuff that goes on in the American church today? It doesn't take very long for you to hop on the internet and find churches present in America that have people living in sin, and they're just saying, it's not really sin. It's no big deal. Who cares if you want to live that, that drunken lifestyle? You know, the grace of God covers that. Who cares if you want to uh, be in this same-sex relationship? You know, that was, that was just then. The Bible just talks about it just being then. It doesn't matter now. And you have these churches that are, they boast, like, this is a safe place to live in sin. That's kind of the world that we, we live in now. Is that we just kind of shepherd and protect a sinful lifestyle. And what Paul says here is that the person ought to be removed. And this is his explanation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, it says this. If we can go ahead and put that up. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so, Paul compares this situation present in the Corinthian church as being this loaf of dough, this, this little batch of dough, where leaven or yeast has been found present. And so 
as the yeast gets put into this dough, it starts to grow and it starts to expand, and it turns into a situation that is becoming prevalent throughout the entire church. And so he says, get rid of the old leaven. Get rid of that batch. Get rid of the yeast so that you can have this untainted loaf of unleavened bread. But church, the truth is, is that in America, we don't want to do that today. That's just kind of the reality of the church, of this, this kind of politically correct world that we live in. We don't want to call sin, sin. We just want to sit here and pretend like if you're living in sin, it doesn't matter. And for the record, I'm just going to throw this out there. It doesn't just happen with topics like homosexuality. It doesn't just happen with that. It happens with anything where somebody feels like their toe is being stepped on. Oh, you're, you're an unmarried couple, and you're living together, and you're engaging in, in sexual immorality, and you're doing all of this. Ah, we'll just turn a blind eye. Oh, you're, you're going out, and you're, you're getting drunk every single Saturday night, and trying to get sober and fill yourself with electrolytes by Sunday morning so that nobody would know what's going on. Ah, it's no big deal. At least you were sober when you walked through the door. Oh, you're, you're, you're doing this, and you know, I, I know that it's not good for you, but it, it's okay, you know? It's no big deal. And I would argue that the church in America has allowed some of this yeast to sit in to the dough that is present in our nation. That we have begun to allow some of this stuff to really sit in. And so we, we choose not to stand for certain things when it comes to the word of God. When it comes to those who would take innocent lives, we just sit here and say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a political issue. Who am I to say what you can and can't do? It's not our job to tell you how to live your life. And we're allowing these things in the church. And I would argue that it all boils down to this idea that who am I to judge you? Who am I to, to judge? Who am I to condemn in action? And I would argue that to an extent, I understand where people are coming from when it comes to that situation. I'm not God. I'm not the one who stands in moral rightness, and I'm not that person. Who am I to judge the world? But when it comes to people in the church, when it comes to Christians, it is on us to hold other Christians accountable. And it's not this idea of, I'm better than you. It's not this idea of, I have my life together, and so I'm going to tell you how to live your life. That's not what it's about. It, it shouldn't come from this, this prideful mentality of, I'm going to tell you what to do and try to get you to look more like me because of how good I am. But rather, it's that I know how broken this world truly is. I know the brokenness that we live in, but I don't want you to live in brokenness. It's not about me trying to show that I'm better than you. It's about the fact that I want you to look more like Christ. I want you to look more like Jesus, and I want you, I want your life to look like what the New Testament portrays. I want your life to look like one that symbolizes Christ's sacrifice for people. And the truth is that I don't want to just do that to you. I want you to do that to me. It's not that I'm trying to judge and condemn and tell you how you should live your life. I would hope that if you see something present in my life that does not line up with the, the truth of Scripture, that you would call me out the same way I would call you out. That's the whole purpose of fellowship. That's the whole purpose of us being the body of Christ, is that when we start to see some of these issues arise in our church, we can tell people that that is not God's will for their life. It's not about what my will is for it. It's about what God's will is for it. And I would hope that when you look at my life, you would do the same thing for me. 
That it's not about what I want, and it's not about what you want, but it's about what God wants for me and what God wants for you. And that's what Paul is saying here. These, these things that he finds present in the Corinthian church, he's saying, look, you've got to get rid of it. Not because you're judgmental, not because you're seeking to condemn, but rather because it's not what God desires for you. And so there should be correction. In the rest of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we, we see that that Paul mentions some of these different things. He talks about how you should not associate with those who claim to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral, or greedy, or an idolater, or verbally abusive, or a drunkard, or a swindler. I think the church has done a, a, a great harm to those who are in same-sex relationships where we've chosen to only focus on their sin. We've chosen to look at those who are in sexual immorality, and we've put sexual immorality onto this huge pedestal of absolutely what not to do. And because we've shined such a huge spotlight on that, we don't focus on the other sins that we just kind of tolerate. And so when it comes to things like gluttony, who cares if the preacher has one too many plates at the local potluck? Now, I know that's... I, I know I'm guilty of that, let's just be honest. <laughs> I know some of you, you're like, don't worry, I'm going to call you out now. And so, like, you know, for our Bible studies, when I grab an extra slice of pie, I know I'm already going to be told, hey, you know, you said, you said don't be gluttonous. How much lemon do you think is in that bread you're about to eat? I already know. I, I know I'm about to get, you know, I, I know I'm going to get corrected. I know. It's, it's okay. I'll live with it. But that's what it's about. It's about us holding each other to the standard, not that we have for others, but that Christ has for his believers. We have to have discipline in our church. We have to. There has to be correction. Many of you, your parents, you know what it's like to raise a child? What happens if your child is just out here misbehaving and not being corrected? What happens if you just allow that misbehavior to go unchecked? It grows. It grows, and so if your child is being disrespectful to you and you don't allow, you, you don't show correction and you just allow it to happen, you start to see that it grows and they start to be disrespectful to other people in authority or, or when they steal something, you know, that's just kind of a minor thing. I, I'll never forget, when I was a kid, uh, you could argue I stole, I would argue that I accidentally borrowed. Uh, I was playing this game with with a uh, with my cousins, and it had it revolved around rocks. Okay, it was rocks. It's not like I stole a hundred dollar bill out of somebody's wallet. I took a rock, but I got spanked for the rock. And it's not because of how big of a deal that rock was. It's because if a kid is not told that it's not bad, make sure I understand this right. If a cold is if a kid is told, there we go. If a kid is, well, not told that stealing is bad, if they are not corrected on that, it might start with a rock and it might turn to a hundred dollar bill down the road. It might start with a rock, it might turn to the necklace in mom's jewelry box. And so that is the purpose of discipline. It's not to shame you and make you feel like you're scum of the earth for making mistakes. It's to let you know, hey, that's not how we live. That's not how we do things. And so there has to be discipline. And I would argue that it's not just in our church, but it's in our own personal lives. And I think what's crazy is that we try to avoid this topic when it comes to sin. But in every single natural issue, the idea of cutting something off is just accepted. 
For example, if you get gangrene in your toe, what happens to that toe? You just sit there and say, oh, well, you know, no big deal to have gangrene in the toe. You just let it grow and grow and grow until suddenly it becomes a big issue? No. You have to remove it. For diabetes, if you have really severe diabetes and it starts to impact your, your leg or it starts to impact the limb, do you just, does your doctor just tell you, oh, it's no big deal, you know, I know you have no feeling in your foot, but that's fine, who cares, it's no big deal. No, they have to take it off before the issue becomes more prevalent. When it comes to heart attacks and heart disease, if, if you have a clogged artery, do they just ignore the idea of doing a bypass surgery? Do they just allow the, the cholesterol and the artery to just stay clogged and they just say, it's no big deal, who cares if the artery is clogged? No, they have to do the bypass surgery. They have to do something to get rid of the thing that is doing the damage. With cancer, the first thing that they try to do is see if maybe it can just be removed quickly before the cancer spreads. But when it comes to sin, we want to just pretend like it's not there. And we have no problem if it spreads. And what, what Paul is saying is that if you see sin present, it's time to deal with it. It's not okay to just let it spread. The point that I want to argue is this. Please don't miss that up. It's important for us as Christians to cut sin off before it grows. Cut sin off before it grows. I love uh, veggie tales, believe it or not. Okay, I love it. I, I'm not, I don't want you to think that I just like sit in my apartment and watch veggie tales all day because I can't get enough of it. That's not what I'm saying. But as a kid, I, I loved uh, veggie tales, and there was one uh, Larry Boy, which that was kind of like an offshoot of veggie tales. I don't know if any of you guys know what I'm talking about, but they turned Larry the Cucumber into this superhero who fights biblical crime for some reason. It's a very strange concept, but anyway, one of the foes that he comes up against is this, like, fib. He comes across, like, the, the fib, and the, the lie is, is this tiny little lie, and it just continues to grow, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And the truth is, is that that Larry Boy movie is the same thing that's going on with our church today. We've allowed certain little pieces of yeast to sit in the church, and it's gone unchecked, and it's continued to grow and grow and grow. And one of the things that I love about the Larry Boy movie is as he's dealing with this thing that started out as such a small little fib that turned into this giant, huge issue that he has to deal with, one of the things that he starts to think is, well, how do we deal with it now? How do we handle this kind of a situation now? Because look at how big it is. How am I supposed to deal with that? And I think that we're in the same situation as a church. Not necessarily as the Church of Bell, I'm not saying that, but I think when it comes to the Church of America, we're faced with a similar situation. Where we've looked at things that are sinful and we've allowed it to kind of sit because we just got too uncomfortable bringing up things uh, and, and trying to correct. And so now we sit and we look at this big issue and we say, how did we get here? Have you ever thought about that? You ever looked at our country and you sat here and been like, how did we get here? Like, how did this turn into this? How did the slope become so elevated? And it's because things go unchecked. That's just the reality of nature. Is that if we allow certain things to sit they grow. When it comes to sin in our church, when it comes to sin in our lives, we have to cut it off before it grows. And the only way that we can really do that is by 
similarly to many medical procedures. Sometimes we don't see it ourselves. Sometimes it, we have to rely on our brothers and sisters in the faith who can look at some of the stuff we're doing and say, look, that's just not okay according to what the Bible says. And I'm not telling you this just to condemn and make you feel judged. I'm saying this because this is what God desires for your life. And it looks very different from what you're doing now. There is a way to confront sin and still be loving. But it's important that we deal with it. And not just pretend like it's no big deal. We have to cut sin off before it spreads. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for the freedoms that we have where we can come and worship you, that we can learn about you and learn from your word. God, I thank you that we don't have to worry about being arrested or having our family messed with just because of what we believe. God, I pray that we won't take your grace for granted that you gave to us on the cross. God, I pray that as we leave here, we would be able to really examine our lives, really look at what we have going on and where we see as it lines up with your word and with your will for us. God, I pray that us as a church, we would be able to be a place where people can be corrected. God, I pray that we would look at others and be able to just hold them accountable. God, not that we're being judgmental, not that we're condemning, but God, that we're just trying to give some correction and allow people to see what your will is truly for their life. God, I pray that we would also just be people who are willing to be corrected. God, that we wouldn't hold on to our pride and our ways of life. God, we just say that this is the way that we've always done it, and this is the way that I am, this is the way I was born. But God, that we would look at your word, allow it to sit in our hearts, allow that to grow, and say, this is how we should live, and I know I've been wrong. God, it's important to do the correction, but also to be corrected. God, we love you, and we thank you for your discipline. We thank you for your love. We thank you that your plan is for us to have good. That you work all things out for our good, even the discipline. We love you, and we thank you. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. As per usual, this will be kind of an invitation. Uh, the band is going to come and give us in one final song. If you have any prayer requests, any praises that you would like to lift up, any decisions to make, this would be the time to do so. Uh, this is also the last Sunday of the month, and so uh, we'll have some ushers passing around the plate for the building fund offering if you feel that you need it.